Okay, I think we're all set. So welcome everybody. Uh, I want to um, welcome the ICA New Music Committee. Um, they're going to be sharing um, two panels with you today, the first of which is demonstrations of various extended techniques. Um, we will have some time at the end for questions, so please type them in the chat, um, both on Facebook and here in Zoom, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Also, any of the resources that they discuss will be compiled and provided to you at the end of the event, um, sometime early next week, once we have a chance to compile all of these resources into a concise little packet for you. So be on the lookout for that. And um, I am going to duck out as well as Jenny, and we're gonna let uh, Kelly uh, Johnson start us off with some talk about circular breathing. So thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. I'm happy to talk about circular breathing today. There is an article that I will refer to. Uh, Robert Spring wrote this article. It's just called Circular Breathing a Method. And uh, like Jessica said, this will be provided to you later. I highly recommend it. Uh, circular breathing is basically just an idea to be able to expand your lines. A lot of contemporary music doesn't have as many rests written in. So sometimes we need to maybe play longer than our lungs would normally allow us. So you're basically putting extra air into your cheeks and then blowing that air out of your cheeks once you get low on air while you're breathing in through your nose. So uh, the first steps of the article are uh, to just puff your cheeks and breathe normally in and out through your nose. And then step two is to allow a small opening or aperture in your lips and to slowly blow air out of your mouth while you're still breathing in normally through your nose. Okay, and then you go to step three, and these are usually a little harder for people. These will take maybe a little longer to get accustomed, but you take a cup of water and a straw, and then you just practice puffing your lips with the straw. And then the next step is we're actually going to start blowing air out and making some bubbles while we're breathing in and out of our nose. Hopefully you could hear my bubbles there. Okay, so the next step is probably the hardest. And that's the one where you're going to um, have this extra air in your cheeks and you're going to start pushing the air out of your cheeks while you take a breath in through your nose. And I did not get this on the first several tries. Um, sometimes it takes a few weeks um, to get the hang of it, but basically um, you're going to try and get one breath. So you're going to blow air out of your cheeks. You're going to breathe in through your nose and then go ahead and continue to blow the air out of your mouth. And the idea is that you want to hear the bubbles or see the bubbles all the way through. Um, sometimes when my students are working on this, they have a really hard time getting the breath in through the nose. And I have found that it's easier if you actually take in a smaller breath through your nose at first. Sometimes it's, it's easier to get the hang of it. The other recommendation is that sometimes if you wait until you're really starved for a breath, it's kind of hard to get the process going. <clears throat> and so I usually feel my cheeks when I start to feel like I'm getting a little low so that I can do, go ahead and do the nose breath before I'm completely starved of air. Okay, once you get the hang of a single breath with the cup, then you'll work on multiple breaths with the cup. And uh, then from there, you can go ahead and go to the mouthpiece and barrel. And uh, you'll notice that you, you need a little more um, coverage maybe from the corner of the lips uh, to get the breath in. You may also notice that there's a bump, um, a change in tone as you go from the nose breath into uh, the horn breath. Um, but once you get a handle on that, then you're going to, to repeat the steps four, five, and six with the mouthpiece and barrel. And then when that's going well, you can add the whole clarinet. And at the end of the article, Bob has listed some exercises that you can work on to add the circular breathing into the clarinet. And it is mostly easier um, right under the throat tones uh, to kind of hide that change in pitch. And for me, I spend a lot of time going just back and forth between two notes to figure out how I wanted to get all of that coordinated. And then you can go, I, I go down 
to the, the lowest part of the horn as well. And so those are kind of the basics in a, in a very, very quick manner. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, please refer to the article. Um, and also, I'm sure any of us would be available to talk to you about it afterwards. Um, I, that was very quick, but I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Jason and Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I'm looking forward to talking to you about the basics of multiphonics. Uh, I, I thought uh, I would just give you a little block of instruction that I'm going to call zero to multiphonic in 120 seconds. Um, there are some fundamental benefits to this, I think, in clarinet playing, even if you're like, oh, these extended techniques are weird. I really think we all need to be able to do them. Um, and it, it increases your awareness of tongue position, your breath support, and your embouchure. So there's great reasons, even if you choose to not do it later, it's much better to be able to choose to not do something rather than just to not be able to do it. Um, so <clears throat> I'm gonna say step one. Play three notes chromatically. If you could go from thumb F up to F sharp, and then open G, and then back to F sharp, chromatically, like this, this gets us started. <laughs> That gets uh, this in our ear, what we're first going to do to learn how to miss voice. So now I'm going to finger clarion register A, B, C, B, uh, or that's the A, B, and C above the staff in the upper clarion, but I'm intentionally going to do three things. I'm gonna use a lower tongue position, more of an oo syllable rather than the classically appropriate E, uh, diffuse inadequate air support, and a somewhat relaxed embouchure. Um, and it's not supposed to sound good, and I might not sound good, we'll see. <sighs> So to say you really know how to produce a good undertone this way. Now the next exercise is how to correct this misvoicing. So we're gonna use the normal fingering for thumb F, then we're gonna to go to the clarion A fingering, but use low tongue position, diffuse inadequate air, and a relaxed embouchure. Then we're gonna correct it by putting our tongue up into that nice E position, maybe firming things up and um, supporting better. <laughs> Next, start by doing it right with clarion A and then intentionally miss voice in a downward slur to the undertone. Last step um, is to miss voice on the clarion A fingering, correct it, and then find the lower pitch to create a dyad or two notes simultaneously. And that's sort of just a matter of experimenting with it to get it right. You could do this on other pitches too. Note we started with A, B, C, B, but I just wanted to go through it pretty efficiently and concisely to get you started on your own. Um, this gives you the vocabulary that is necessary to start creating dyads and uh, ultimately other multiphonics. Um, if you'd like an additional resource, check out uh, Ronald Caravan's uh, preliminary exercises in contemporary techniques for clarinet, which is uh, just a great kind of beginner's guide to uh, to all these uh, techniques that we need to know. I'm going to turn things over to Jason so he could talk about bass clarinet and uh, spectral multiphonics. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, okay, so uh, the the multiphonics that um, Chris uh, was was just talking about um, involve a lot of uh, different uh, fingerings and and underblowing um, and and false fingerings to to find. Um, the you know, different sounds in multiphonics. Uh, there's another way to do multiphonics, uh, which is uh, called spectral multiphonics, uh, which is basically playing a fundamental and then uh, pitching it in a way that you get all of the, a, a lot more um, overtones on top of it as well. Uh, so 
this works, you can do this on, on all the clarinets, but it works best on, on the big clarinets. Um, so the, the way that it sounds. <laughs> So you can hear all I'm doing um, is what once I, I start the multiphonic and then I'm, I'm able to w using my, my voicing and tongue position uh, kind of cycle through uh, different higher higher partials uh, of the of, of that multiphonic. Um, so the way that that you get it uh, going in the first place is you just um, so that this works on on in, in the, the shell mode register, the, the lowest register, and the lowest notes in particular. Um, so you start just by playing the note. And then by dropping your jaw, but keeping the airstream high, rather than, rather than dropping your jaw and letting the air go down with it, like, like, like how you might do a pitch bend, but keep keeping that, that air um, in, in a higher position. Then you're able to, to split that note like that. And it's the, the, the same thing, since not everybody has a contra bass clarinet, um, I'd say, you know, same thing on a bass clarinet. So in, in a way, it's it's the same kind of way that you you approach doing doing some altissimo notes, um, but trying to keep that that low fundamental. Uh, and it it works as well on on clarinet, but it's it, it's not quite it, it's not quite as easy, but. Uh, so those those are spectral multiphonics um you know and if sometimes if uh if you if you run into a piece you know where a composer just kind of writes like multiphonic but they don't specify specific notes or specific fingering or anything like that um and, and it's often that that they, they just kind of want that sound you know that that particular that kind of gritty multiphonic -y sound it's probably something like that that, that um they're looking for uh, and if you have any more questions about it uh towards the end of the session then we'll we'll take some more uh and i will turn it now over to greg and quarter tones thanks jason well Quarter tones. Um, some people might have played around with these before. And if you have your clarinet out right now, feel free to play along with me. You're muted anyway, right? So no one will hear. Um, but I'm going to take you through um, the most important parts about quarter tones. Uh, a lot of times people think about the special fingerings that have to go along with these things. Um, but really, the most essential part is actually getting your ear to understand what those things are. Um, I certainly remember the first time I was playing quarter tones. I, they sounded just wrong to me. And so finding where those intonations are and, and quantizing your ear that way is probably the most important step. So got to have a tuner that can show where you are, not just, you know, are you at the right semitone, but parts in between. So um, I'm going to pick a particular part of the clarinet where the quarter tones make a lot of sense, which is if we go from the clarinet G down, uh, the ring finger is going to be able to add each of the quarter tones. So we have a, a G, and if we go down to the G quarter flat, it's like the, the G flat with the sliver key added. So G, G quarter flat, F sharp, F quarter sharp, you just add that ring finger again, F, F quarter flat, and E. And so if you have your clarinet and you want to play along with me, um, if you have a tuner handy, it's even better. But let's just kind of go through and hear what that sounds like and get our ear adjusted to that.
And so notice that each one of those, we're trying to really center that and be very, very clear. Um, an important thing about quarter tones is that we're not really changing any of the uh, voicings other, other than what we normally do uh, between registers because the fingering should be taking care of the pitch. We shouldn't be adjusting the pitch with the uh, embouchure at all. Uh, and then in the real world, when you're playing quarter tone pieces, you don't have time to do that quickly any more than you, you would really when you're playing Mozart or Brahms. And so once you feel comfortable with doing that, then going from the bottom up also works. It, on the way down, it's nice because each time you're adding the ring finger, lifting it, adding the ring finger, lifting it, adding, lifting. So on the way back up, we start with that E, and then we go to that F quarter flat, F, F, uh, F quarter sharp, F sharp, G quarter flat, G. I'll stand up this time so you can look at the fingers at the same time. If right now that is sounding super weird to your ear and it, it's not feeling comfortable yet, going through that particular set is a great place to start to, to begin making that make sense. Once that feels solid for you, you can begin to go uh, throughout more of the range of the instrument. Um, and uh, earlier, Chris had talked about the Ronald Caravan um, prelim preliminary exercises and etudes that has an excellent part right in the middle of the book with listings for quarter tones throughout uh, all of the instrument. Um, and it's interesting to note, of course, that some of the quarter tones at the very bottom of the instrument don't exist or uh, in the middle of the instrument aren't very good. And so um, for those of you who are avid readers of the Clarinet Magazine, um, you might have seen an article about my instrument that has these extra tone holes and keys. Um, that's actually because the instrument isn't designed well for quarter tones. And so what we have now with this quarter tone extended clarinet is the possibility to play some of those lowest ones. And those notes just don't exist on the, the regular quarter tone, uh, regular instrument playing quarter tones, um, but we get to use them on this. So um, anyone who has more questions about that afterwards, happy to answer. Um, but for right now, we're going over to Stephanie, who's going to talk about uh, multiple tonguing. Hi. So I'm going to talk about uh, double tonguing first, and I'm going to share my screen with some exercises. Um, you can find this in a technique workbook on ajiduo.com. Also, we'll put it in the resources for the ICA website. Um, the first thing that you should uh, think about when you're approaching double tonguing is what syllables you're going to use. I use do goo do goo do goo. Um, other people use tiki tiki or taka taka or other variations. Um, do goo do goo seems to be the smoothest for me personally, um, so I'm going to use that today. Um, I would focus on the vowel of that uh, syllable, the oo, and less on the da and the ga consonances. The more heavy you are with your uh, consonances, the more heavy it's going to be in the articulation. So try to be nice and relaxed, and if you have your clarinet with you, say do goo do goo do goo do goo do goo, and we can try it together. Um, so what I want to do first is this rhythm on the prelanginous exercise one. Do goo do, do goo do, do goo do. And if you have your clarinet, we'll just do one beat. One, two, three. <laughs> And if you're able to do one beat, then you can try two beats in a row, do goo do, do goo do, do goo do, do goo do, do goo do. And you could even play the Langinus uh, page 22 exercise double tongued if you wanted to try that um, instead of single tonguing it. Um, so once you can do a couple beats together, you might want to practice more endurance exercises like number three, do goo do goo do goo do goo do, do goo do goo do goo do goo do. I recommend starting about 
100 to 120 on your metronome just so you can get used to this uh, new syllable work. Um, some students I've had um, only able to do it quickly, like 144, 160, and then they have to bring it down to control it. And exercise number two is really great for refining this motion and working on your control. Um, so go ahead and try saying do goo do goo on the eighth notes and continue using them through the sixteenth notes. Do goo do goo do goo do goo do do goo do goo do goo do goo do. One two three. And just keep going up. Um, the hardest part about double tonguing is getting into the upper registers. So the next things you might want to do are five note patterns, going up and down a five note scale, um, one octave scales, two octave scales, three octave scales, and then my favorite exercise is right here, and that's on page 32 of this workbook. Um, that you can find on agduo.com. And I like to start this exercise pretty slowly and work it up as fast as I can. The great thing about this exercise is your tongue gets a break and you have an opportunity to reset. The other thing I like about this exercise is that it pushes you to articulate into your extreme register. And every day is maybe a little bit better than the day before. This takes a lot of patience. Um, I've been uh, playing double tonguing for a few years before I felt comfortable playing it in public for the first time. And the old adage that it's gonna sound bad before it sounds good is completely true. So a tip for you is to play um, your single tonguing and double tonguing back and forth and try to match what you sound like on that single tonguing. Um, so for example, if I play this exercise first single tongued, and then try to match the quality and evenness with the do goo do goo do goo do. And then just keep going and going into the stratosphere. And you'll know that um, once you get to a certain part that you need to refine the motion and lighten up. Another tip for lightening up is using earplugs. Uh, not just earbuds, but earplugs. You'll be able to feel in your mouth the hit on the roof of the mouth for the back syllable and the touch of the reed on the do goo do goo. So uh, when you're feeling that, hopefully you can lighten up and work on refining this motion so that you can go faster and higher. Um, other things I use to practice um, away from the clarinet, if I'm in the car, I might scat these double tonguing syllables or if I'm at the gym listening to music, I might scat my double tonguing syllables because usually when you're working out, the music is at a faster tempo. Um, and that's really all I have about double tonguing. I need to move to slap tonguing next. And then the first thing I'm gonna do with slap tonguing, let me share the screen now to the slap tongue guide, which is also on agduo.com. If you have an old reed lying around, um, I, I think I'm actually gonna stop the share so you can see what I'm doing better. But this slap tongue guide is on agduo.com and you can read about it there. You'll need an old reed and the tongue position for slapping is very similar to anchor tonguing. Um, you want to put the tip of your tongue down right here behind the bottom teeth and you're going to grab the reed with the middle of the tongue and you want to try to form your embouchure so that when you want to play clarinet it will actually work well if you don't have a reed you can use your finger and feel the grabbing it's kind of like a, a horse call sound Um, you can also just grab your lip. You know, COVID, you might not want to be putting your fingers in your mouth right now. Um, the next step, once you can get the reed to pop, 
would be trying it on a bass clarinet neck and mouthpiece. I recommend trying this on a bass clarinet first or a larger clarinet or a saxophone that's larger with a mouthpiece. It's easier to get the pop on the reed um, on a larger instrument and then refine what you're doing and apply it to a smaller instrument like the soprano clarinet. So now that you've got your pop, form your embouchure and see if you can pop the reed on the neck and the mouthpiece. The hardest part is adding the air for me. It took me a long time to get the coordination. So remember, it's slap, then air. And it's like a puff of air, it's not super aggressive. Um, the best syllable that I could think of that matches what I'm doing is like a ta, 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 or a da, 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 where you grab the reed with a ta or da, and then a little bit uh, air. Um, still, the tongue is down in the mouth like an anchor tongue. This is the part where I struggled the most, and I used a mirror to help watch the jaw motion. A lot of times I moved my jaw too much, and then I would squeak or squawk. Then I think once you get that sound on the neck, you can apply it to your bass clarinet or your clarinet, depending on what you have. Start with some low notes first. Um, the higher notes are possible, it's just a little more difficult, especially if you're trying to refine your jaw motion and not let it move. Uh, practice at different dynamics. I find that if I play softer slaps, I don't um, move as much, and then you can refine that motion so that you'll be able to do it higher and on the soprano clarinet. I'm gonna stop there and hand it over to Jason so he can continue to talk about slap tonguing. Okay, uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so uh, everything uh, Steph just said is is accurate. <laughs> I, I agree with all that. Um, yeah, so the, the, the thing, what she was saying about the get, getting the air with it. Um, so what, what I found um, is, I, I think of, I really think of slap tongue as being, it's just another type of articulation. You're just articulating with a point further back on your tongue. Um, so with that, so I'm thinking when I'm doing it, So, yeah, it's it's just right as 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 it's yeah, like she said, kind of like anchor tonguing, where further back on my tongue is is on the tip of the reed. It's getting the, it's pulling the reed down just a bit, and at the same time, I'm putting the air through it. Um, and so I I also have a couple different types of slap tongues. Uh, so one I call um, a tone slap. So that's where you, you articulate with the slap and then keep the air going. So it's just like, again, just like a, a hard articulation and continuing with the air. Uh, the other is a staccato slap which where, where you, you don't follow through with the air. You're still, you're still using the air to, to get the reed vibrating uh, but you don't follow through with it but you still you still get this definite pitch on, on every note um, the other way is to so here you're hearing you you can hear that slap but I'm not uh, I'm not making the reed vibrate as as I'm releasing. So it has a much more kind of hollow sound to to the slap uh, and without without really a definite pitch. Like a little bit from the resonance of the in instrument, but Um, and then one, another one is just kind of, I call it a bit like a tongue grab, where 
I don't know how much you you can really hear on that, but it's 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 a very quiet thing, and all all that really is it's it's just the tongue suctioning the reed without any air behind it at all. So you can also do that, you know, with the mouth open. So the the progression is kind of like this tongue sticking to the reed. Mm. There, where the, the the tongue is just slapping the reed, but without the air, or without with, without the pitch, but a little bit of air, uh, and then uh, getting put putting the air behind so that the reed vibrates, and then continuing the air at, holding the air after the slap, and it's the same as Seth said. It's um, it, it's much easier to do the the larger the reed the easier it is. So bass clarinet, contrabass clarinet, uh, baritone saxophone, they're, they're all very, very easy. Uh, but the same principle applies to the smaller clarinet. So like even on, on E flat clarinet. It's the, the same principle uh, to, to, to apply it. You just have to, to learn to kind of refine the way that your tongue is working. Uh, but first definitely learn it on, on the larger clarinets. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to, oh, actually, no, I'm, I'm going to stay and uh, Greg will join me <laughs> to talk about, um, yeah, flutter tongue, growling, and singing while playing. Do you want to start out since you already were doing that? Sure. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so flutter tongue, um, I guess there, there's kind of, there's two ways that, that people flutter tongue, either by rolling your R, um, which is the, the way that I do it. Uh, but people that can't roll their R, I guess, do it more back in the throat, which is, I'm not so good at that. So um, I, I think, Greg, Greg, that's how you do it, right? Well, I do the front of the tongue. There, there's actually okay. a, few, a few different ways, um, and it's, it's like a whole continuum. The important thing um, that I think we should mention at this point is that during these flutter tongues, your tongue isn't actually contacting the reed. It's really a disruption in the airway. Uh, and so um, that front of the, the mouth tongue, like a Spanish art, is the way that I typically do it. There's also more of a, a mid tongue, um, like more like the French R, and they, they don't sound identical. Here's the front of the tongue, and then here's the middle of the tongue, and they're a little bit they're a little bit different. That um, that more glottal um, one is actually a, a vibration of the soft palate rather than the tongue, um, and that one is one that's it's an excellent one that people can sometimes learn more easily, um, as we all know. What, the way that we use the tongue has a, a genetic component to it as well. Just like you know, some people can curl their tongue and some people can't. Um, and so if this is a specifically difficult thing, um, a good thing to practice is to, to gargle, take water and just, you know, that same motion that we use for gargling is the one that we can use for, for creating that, that soft palate. <laughs> And you can you can hear even then there's a little bit of a difference in there, um, and if any of you are budding composers and you're like, ooh, I'm gonna try to write for all these different kinds of flutter tongues, oh please don't. <laughs> That's <laughs> we're we're all working so hard just to get one of them out, and so um, we'll you know kind of leave that up to the performer usually. Um, but those are all, and it really it's kind of going from front to to back of uh, the way of executing that. Um, and this also is an interesting segue into the idea of singing and playing because um, I've heard of a few people saying like, I have a hard time doing a flutter. And so instead um, I do the growl, which is really singing in playing. Um, and Jason, I don't know what your perspective is to start with that. Yeah, so um, I, yeah, when people first told me that they, they do this throat thing or like a growl, um, it, it actually it surprised me because I like I, I see those as very different things, <laughs> um, and even even the difference between growling and singing I I I, I have a bit of a difference. Um, so you know for me a growl uh, a growl is more kind of in the front of the neck like oh, uh, 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 where singing is more. Uh, 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 um, and the the effect while you 
play is it it's it's subtle but but it is it, it is there um so like uh, whereas uh, that was singing whereas growling so for me like the the growl is has less pitch has less pitch to it it's more it's more just that kind of um uh like a like a vocal fry like, uh, kind of thing that that's just kind of getting that growling sound in in into the reed uh without worrying about pitch whereas when i'm when i'm singing it's more ooh, it's more like like my actual singing voice that i'm using at, at the same time as playing i think i think another thing to think about if you were really are interested in thinking about singing and playing the sensation it might more accurately be described as a hum really because you have the mouth closed so if you think about mm, uh, the other thing i remember when i first started doing this is we're used to using like clarinet level air support but then we have these very untrained vocal cords and if you try to put that kind of force through um, you'll almost immediately start coughing because your vocal cords aren't used to this so um if you're in the in the mood to try some singing and playing try playing at a very delicate volume um, so that you're not doing that. Um, many people have a hard time making that happen at all because when we normally play, when we're blowing, the vocal cords are cleared out of the way of the throat. Um, and to even engage those sometimes feels awkward. So the, the exercise that I have people think about is first to start with that hum. Mm -hmm. Then hum through the clarinet. Mm -hmm. Really the same idea. Then try to hum while letting some air through. We're not playing anything on the clarinet, but just hum while letting some air. Because normally when we're humming, there's not, not really much air exchange. So the two actually feel slightly different. So and that's what we're really going to be trying to do. So um, for so some, for some people, that act has to be the first part that they get um, because what many of my students have happened is when they start to play the hum goes away and so getting used to that and then try to once you can sort of make that happen maybe sing or hum the same note that you're trying to play so so that the two uh, frequencies uh, have a constructive interference that's the least problematic on the uh, on the throat. As soon as you deflect the sound a little bit, that beating, you feel that physically. And it really uh, it takes a little bit of training and work. And so you can actually do some vocal exercises. To kind of uh, limber up and, and get a little bit of um uh, strength in those vocal cords and some flexibility and, and also some independence so that's probably about as much as we have <laughs> time to talk about <laughs> you can go on for a while about that so uh, i think the next thing we have is glissando and pitch bending with chris and john Hello again. Um, I just wanted to uh, walk you through some basics of how to pitch bend if you haven't done this before uh, and give you kind of uh, what I consider the preliminary dialogue that's necessary to approach that famous solo in Rhapsody in Blue that every clarinetist has to play. Um, I think uh, there's a variety of approaches uh, with a register in terms of basic pitch bending. Um, I like to do it in the clarion register. Some like to do it in the altissimo. Some like to do it in the shallow mode register, but you uh, you can um, choose your own adventure there. Um, so I think uh, basics, first thing is to figure out what you're doing with tongue position. Uh, it actually bears some similarity to what we talked about with multiphonics earlier. So I think it's best to actually start just with the mouthpiece or the mouthpiece and barrel. It gives you something a little more to hang on to. And maybe with a tuner, uh, widely accepted with the barrel, we're going to have an F sharp. And trying to just voice down a half step, uh, going from maybe E to like ooh. That's your basic vocabulary. Um, note, when you drop your tongue like that, 
in this uh, particular technique that requires more air. Um, next we can add the barrel onto the clarinet. So I like to do this. This is actually a fun aural skills thing to do in lessons too. So um, feel free to try that. Um, now I'm gonna play using normal fingerings, just good old CBC. in the upper clarion register. Now I'm gonna use that missed voicing technique I just showed you on the mouthpiece and barrel alone and match what I just played. Um, it also uh, helps to kind of think of relaxing a little bit here, not too much um, for, a, for a semitone though. Then widen the interval by half step. Always normal to get the sound of this in your ear. It gets nastier sounding and harder and you just have to blow through. One tip, if the sound breaks, like you all, all of a sudden there's no tone, like you get an undertone or something, that is just a, that's just an indicator that you need to blow through more. So to use more air. Um, if you keep going through this process to the point that you get to about a fourth, like C to G, um, I think you've got the necessary vocabulary to uh, deal with that upward gliss thing, which um, is usually done um, between um, D and the staff up to, to high C. The rest of it's done with fingerings. Um, note that down is easier than up at first. So um, the next step is to start with uh, your fingering for C and then intentionally start misvoicing. So like you're gonna produce B to C, but without using your fingers, something like that. Think beginner's approach to the clarion register in the fifth grade band room. Um, next, start working with your fingers and tongue together. So uh, you can start uh, using that nice uh, sort of misvoiced sound production thing and just sort of smear your finger across the clarinet. while simultaneously raising your tongue gradually. That's just a primer. Um, you could check out Larry Guy's book, um, Embouchure Building. Um, there's actually a little article in there that walks you through the complete procedure. Um, but that's just a primer. I'm gonna turn this over to John. He wants to talk a little bit about uh, pitch bending and klezmer, I think, which yeah. is really cool. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, I, I mean, that was a great explanation. I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add to that. Um, it's, it's a similar idea um, in klezmer music in terms of um, using, uh, using a combination of the embouchure and, and kind of the jaw on the throat. Uh, the thing that's a little bit different in klezmer is you almost have this kind of sense of kind of a lunging toward the end of it. And the thing that I find um, useful about um, learning to do that, even if you're not ultimately going to do a lot of klezmer music, is that um, it kind of opens your mind and your ear to a wider range of, like sort of a larger sound world of what the clarinet can do, which I mean, even even if you're not going to hopefully apply that directly to the Mozart concerto, um, I don't think any of us would want to hear that. But um, I think anything you can do that sort of gives you a broader conception of what the clarinet is capable of is useful to all of your playing. So just um, um, what I'm doing really when I do that is it's the sense of my jaw going down and my throat also kind of tightening and, and the sound kind of going yeah yeah um, so I don't think there's time to get into too much more of that because I think we want to be able to have some questions but that's just a very quick um, introduction to pitch bending and klezmer <laughs> thanks I think uh, if there's any questions now I think Great, thank you guys so much. Um, does anyone have any questions for any of the panelists? You can all join me here. I don't have to hang out here by myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, does anybody on Facebook or here in uh, the Zoom chat have any questions for the panelists before we move on to the next session? Um, in general about you know articulation, about you know, multiple tonguing, circular breathing, um, or any comments? Have any of you had any difficulties in practicing or trying some of these techniques on your own? I know Jenny and I were just having a conversation about uh, slap tonguing and how challenging slap tonguing has been for both of us. So, and I think it um, it takes a long time. Like I think I spent three years before before I could do it. 
and it was two years of really struggling and completely failing, uh, mostly trying to learn on my own and just getting tips and hints from other people. Um, I think then I finally had some actual instruction on like, this is what you need to do um, before I started actually, okay, I'm getting something. And then it was still a whole nother year before I was like, okay, I can do this whenever I want. I, I know how to do it. Um, and I think part of what actually pushed that to happen was I, I was just playing pieces with slap tonguing. So, and at first I was just kind of like, bleh, 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 like doing a hard tongue and like it sounding really bad and, but just trying something and then you know the more you just kind of keep at it and eventually like oh hey like i can slap tongue now but it's it's a very long and frustrating process and um for almost everybody and then once in a while somebody is able to just do it immediately and makes us all mad but <laughs> it's like <laughs> but mike yeah, lowenstern just, said in the last session he said if someone asks you if you can do something just say yes and then figure it out yeah <laughs> i think we can all learn from that lesson you know just you know i i remember when I was uh, the first uh, community orchestra that I had applied to play in, they called me and said, can you come and play? And there was a misunderstanding about my resume and I showed up and they handed me a percussion folder. <laughs> and I was like, what, <laughs> what is this? And it was like bass drum, cymbal part, snare part. And I'm like, I don't, okay. <laughs> so I just did it. And then I told them after the concert was over that I didn't play percussion. And they were like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> So, I mean, I think you can you can learn from a lot of these different experiences simply by trial and error and just forcing yourself into that into that uncomfortable situation and, and trying that. And you'll you'll be surprised how many of these techniques that you're either afraid of or maybe you don't really think sound good to you that you enjoy. And the same is true for a lot of modern music and, and new music that you hear when you play it. It's a much different experience than when you're listening to it. I can tell you that some of the pieces that I ended up loving the most in my studies have been pieces that I looked at the paper and I was like, what? I don't know about that. Or listened to the recording. I don't know about that. And then I actually learned it and I'm like, oh my God, I love this so much. This is so much fun to play. And I've learned so much about myself as a player from this experience. So uh, yeah. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Say be oh. patient. Sorry, go oh, ahead. Yeah. I just encourage you to to work with with uh, these exercises and making sounds that you might not like at first, uh, just because it'll enhance your your vocabulary of clarinet playing and voicing. And I really find it makes you like really loosen up and just like use the air. We can get so tight and tense about thinking about e with the tongue, ooh with the lips, all this classic stuff that that we're told to do when we're learning our basic skills. But uh, it's a it's a really it's a really important that you kind of delve into this because that could actually kind of lock you up and make you like really inflexible. So this makes you a more flexible player, even if you choose not to actually do any of this on the concert stage ever. I wanted to just jump on uh, what Chris was saying. Um, I've heard sometimes people have uh, criticisms of contemporary techniques. Well, I don't want to make the clarinet sound like that. Um, I've noticed a, a marked improvement in my ability to control the instrument with all the work that I've done with multiphonics and uh, with with understanding the voicing of the instrument. Um, if you really want to be able to play at, at high uh, parts of tessitura with ultimate control, understanding exactly what goes into doing that is is essential for that. And really, that's what multiphonics are all about. So sometimes you can use multiphonics, even if you never want to perform one, just to make your traditional playing better too. Stephanie, you were going to say something a minute ago. Oh, I was just going to say, be very patient. Sometimes you can get discouraged. We all have good days and bad days, but overall you're building on those skills. And with the slap tonguing or double tonguing or any of those things that just take tons of perseverance, eventually you're going to get better. You're going to get better. And it's going to sound bad before it sounds good. Um, I worked on slap tonguing and double tonguing for a few years before I was even comfortable playing it for other people. And for people in my house, Joshua or my parents or whoever was with us, got to hear all the squawks and horrible noises coming out of my instruments. But it's just part of the process. So know that it can be frustrating, but you'll come out stronger on the other side. And I have one other thing to say, um, these uh, new techniques are not just in our own solo repertoire, orchestral writers are doing this too. I played a piece by Nina Young recently that had um, glissando harmonics on the bass clarinet and it, it was really intense solo work and I, 
I uh, was like, wow, cool, game on. But you know, that can be kind of intimidating. So I encourage you to explore all of these techniques because you might have to use them one day. That's great advice. Um, with that, I think we need to wrap up so that we can um, give the uh, people in attendance a chance to get uh, a bathroom break, some water, and then get our next session started in just a few minutes. Um, I want to thank the New Music Committee for being here. Um, Stephanie is our chair of the New Music Committee, and we actually have an upcoming meeting on um, Valentine's Day on the 14th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can find the link for that on the ICA website under committees. Um, it just says um, you can see the session upcoming meeting there and you can join us. Please join us. Um, these committee meetings are open and these may be the core members of the committee, um, but we invite you all to participate and help us move um, the ICA's initiatives forward for each of the committees. So check that out on the website. We will see you all very soon for the next session with the composer collaborative process. Thank you again. Bye.